Awesome. Cool. So yeah, let's do this intro. So thank you all for sticking around while uh, we do intermissions and whatnot. Um, this next talk is Dave Mayer, uh, Almost Free Adversary Emulations. And I've known Dave for a lot of years. I don't, I don't even know if we should count them, but it's what, maybe five years, maybe a little more. And around, there. around there, right? And um, I work, I used to work in an enterprise and hiring, as you all know, is very, very difficult. I also teach for SANS and SANS has a number of CTFs, right? A lot of capture the flag events, a lot of challenges. And I saw actually a few people that, that did very well on these challenges and Dave was one of them. Uh, and I see Doug still were there as well. He was another one uh, that just, you know, won net wars, won tournament of champions, got many different coins and i of course used that to recruit and thankfully uh dave was able to move down to south florida and join our team uh in the internal red team and we've been friends ever since um he has multiple years experience at enterprise but also experience in consulting so you caught the pre-show banter right the that balance is is so important for a red teamer and he recently joined grim and by recently i mean two days ago so congrats on that Dave, welcome uh, to the Grimm family, and thank you for doing a talk in such short notice. Uh, doing a big conference talk uh, two days in, I think, is phenomenal. So, um, welcome, and over to you. Thanks, George. So, start off a uh, little bit about me. Uh, Dave Mayer uh, just started with Grimm a couple of days ago. Uh, this is day three on the job. Um, been specializing for the past few years in doing red teaming and penetration testing uh, for various different clients. Previously, uh, I was head of red team operations, senior security consultant, and as George said, when I we worked together, I was on the red team at one of the global financials uh, that we worked together at. Uh, I gave a lot of that insight from the enterprise perspective. So what am I gonna be talking about today? I'm gonna talk about doing an adversary emulation and talk to a number of people work internally at an organization. They want to know how can I do an adversary emulation, a red team? What can I do to get one up and going? Don't have a budget for it. Want to be able to do something and just show some value to the business so that they can get it on the budget perhaps for the next year or get a, another company to come in and help them out by doing a red team engagement or even a penetration test to a certain degree. Um, and what are you looking for when you're doing that? You want to go and test your technology, your people, your processes. You want to verify those controls that you have in place. Do they actually work? Uh, this is your process that is on paper. Have you ever gone and tested to make sure that people are actually following the process? Because it can just be one little hole in the process that allows an attacker to get in and gain access to your organization. You want to detect the threats as they're coming at your organization. You don't want to be able to find them after the fact. Um, and later on, say it happened two, three months ago, you want to be able to detect things in real time. Uh, so that you can defend properly against them. Um, some other things you might want to check, what data can get exfilled out of your country company? Uh, what is your crown jewels that you have? What's special about it? Why would an attacker want to come after you? And is it something that they're able to actually reach before you're able to detect them within your organization? And if that were to happen, what damage could be done to the organization overall? Uh, there could be, depending on your line of business, depending on what they get, it could be severe reputational damage that's done to the organization and long lasting effects there afterwards. Uh, if you start testing these things ahead of time, uh, getting a plan in place, it can help put you out in front of what's actually gonna happen to your organization. And you wanna test these. You don't want someone else to come in and test your organization for you. You don't want someone coming in, breaching it, getting your data and pulling it out, siphoning it out and being left to do the cleanup and incident response. If you spend some time ahead of time going and doing these, this testing yourself, you won't have to go and do the cleanup or hopefully you won't have to. You'll be able to have all your detections in place. So as I was saying before, a lot of people that I've talked to in the consulting side, they wanted to find out um, for internal organizations how they can do this themselves. And there's always the guys that red team engagements are very expensive. You need to get specialized to, uh, tools. You need people with certain skills, skill sets to go and do all this work. And it's just, it can be done without having to go and hire other companies to come in. Um, 
yeah, you'll be starting out with some of the more well-detected tools, but you need to build up from what's out there. And just to let you know, I'll go through in this talk a way to go and do a red team engagement. And at the end of this, you'll be walking away being able to do one for less than $100. So you'll be able to do a full adversary emulation red team engagement for less than $100 uh, with all the resources that you need to be able to do it. One thing I cannot harp on enough though, is always get permission. Yes, you might be internal to your organization, you're on the information security team. Uh, you need to get permission from as high up the food chain as you can, whether it be the CIO, the CISO, get permission to do this ahead of time. You might need to have some discussions about where that data can go, how you're allowed to operate and get those rules of engagement down on paper. Uh, those are going to be what you live by for this. Um, maybe you'll be doing this just as you have a couple hours a week in between your other projects and be working on this engagement that way. That's one way that I've worked on it in the past uh, at a smaller company. A couple hours here, a couple hours there, fit it in between other things that I'm working on and was able to get go and get up the penetration testing program running. These are things you can do to drive value on your little pet projects that you might have that might not yet fit into the larger organization scope, but you'll be able to do this and try and bring their bring this to their site and be able to see it and the value that it has. So once you get permission, one of the first things you want to start out doing is getting OSINT. Uh, get as much info you can on your company. What data is out there on the internet about your company? Um, something I don't see a lot of organizations doing is going out and checking regularly what data is out there, what's there, what can people discover about my company? Um, if you go out on Shodan, you can go and take a look what servers are there, potentially what services are running on the servers, uh, what hardware is in use, maybe the VPN that's listed is in use is listed. Uh, you can go through a lot of those services that are listening and take a look. Um, you can use services or programs like Multigo or Spiderfoot to go and start taking a look what employees work at the company, what data is available. Um, I like to go and download a ton of password dumps. I got a giant external hard drive full of them. And I'll go and start searching through them for the companies either I'm taking a look at doing some work for to see what's there, um, just to even get an idea of their exposure footprint before beginning an engagement. Uh, these are things you can do passively and run in the background and then go and take a look at that data uh, once it's finished running and start taking a look at it and digesting it. There's going to be a lot of information there. Um, Google dorks have been great. Uh, go pull things down. Uh, if you don't want to hit your organization server directly, which if you're working internally, really won't be much of an issue. Um, but on a full red team engagement, you can go and start pulling some documents they might have out there. There might be some important data, such as uh, the file share, where the document was originally created, uh, who created it. it, might give you some internal domain names, uh, fully qualified domain, the NetBIOS domain. And those are things that will come in handy for you uh, throughout the engagement as you're working on planning things. So really spend your time. Uh, I can't stress it enough uh, going out and taking a look at all of these. All of them have free trial accounts that you can get. Um, LinkedIn, you can go and start connecting with people. Uh, Vincent Yu has a great tool out there called LinkedIn that you can use for searching and scraping through LinkedIn profiles that you're able to view on LinkedIn. And you can, then you can use that to go and create a list of users to go and fish. Uh, so a lot of great tools here that you can use to go and start culling a lot of the public data that is out there. Uh, reduce it down to something that's useful for you as you're working to do that. Um, so once you have your OSINT completed, you're starting to plan, all right, what are we going to do as the exercise here? So for command and control, there's so many to pick from out there. Um, there's a number on the commercial side of a Cobalt Strike, Red Team Toolkit, Innuendo is great as well, uh, but there's a number of open source ones. And I started started from using open source C2s. Luckily, thank you to George and team for creating the C2 matrix. It's been great. It allows you to go out there now and filter through the C2s of what you want to go and pick. So in this case, here's a screenshot. I went and filtered on price for NA. And I was able to take a look at all the command and controls that are here that are open source and can be used that are not a commercial product. And from when I had started, there used to be back one or two. Uh, now there's, I think it was somewhere or up around 40 or so I had heard George say that 40 different C2s that are available open source to use and be able to use on engagements. Uh, there's other also data, other data in here as well for what type of callbacks are going to be used, uh, what type of communications there are, 
uh, is it HTTP, SMB, what's available? And you can use all of those to filter down and say, all right, this is the right C2 for me. And then you can use that and start moving on with the rest of your engagement at that point. So when you're going to set this up, a couple different tracks you can take for your command and control. You can use a domain um, or you can use just an IP address to call back to directly. Um, I typically tend to always go with a C2 domain. Um, I've, gone, no, I've used a number of different methods over the year, uh, years. Uh, expireddomains.net is great. It lists everything that's expiring every day. So you can go out, start taking a look at what domains just expired. Are they categorized? Um, are they available still to purchase? Some people uh, buy them and purchase them right away. Um, you can filter on the top level domain as well. So you can do .com, .net, whatever you are interested in. Um, Domain Hunter from Threat Express is great. It, it does a lot of that too, and we're on an automated basis to go out and take a look at what's available and you can purchase and then go buy that domain and you have it to be able to use. Cloud Raccoon is an awesome tool from Nick Landers over at Silent Break. Um, allows you to go out, create an account with either uh, Azure, AWS, GCP, and go and enumerate through on like AWS, the elastic IPs that are available for your the pool that you're connected to. So it'll actually go iterate through, grab each of the elastic IPs that are available and see if there's a domain that's already tied to that IP. Um, that way you don't have to go and purchase a domain and you already probably will have categorization on it. So it's not something you're gonna have to worry about, about going out and getting one of those domains, building a website, getting it categorized, uh, a lot of time that you would have to work through there to go and do that. Um, I have also gone out and bought my own domain. I wanted it to look specifically like some other organization, a similar name. Uh, and you can go and create your own domain, uh, buy it, and then work and go and build a website uh, so that you can get it categorized and have it there ready to use. This will take more time, but if you're working on an internal project, you usually have a good amount of time at, in between everything else that you're working on to do that. So you can go and build the site. It will give you some uh, practice there as well and just taking a look at what goes into putting together these type of engagements from a higher level. So once you have that domain, uh, you could have either bought one from an expired domain, um, found one that's out there on from Cloud Raccoon or gone and built your own. And then you can start going through a lot of these dom uh, categorization services to see if it is categorized. Uh, this is just a handful of them. Uh, you can go and take a look, see what how they're currently categorized. Uh, some of them, if you just buy a domain, a couple days after it might just be listed as new domain or domains less than one week old. And you'll need to go and build that site out, as I said, and get it categorized. Uh, you can use some tools like Domain Cat and Chameleon there to go and check categorization across a number of services and see how your current site is categorized. Um, and one other thing I forgot, uh, if you're going out there to expire domains, purchasing domains that have already been out there, you can go back to the Wayback Machine uh, on the Internet Archive and go and pull an old version of that website and then rebuild the site this way it used to be previously. And it saves on an, a bunch of time being able to go and do that and just get a website stood back up quickly that has it categorized the same way that it was before. Uh, huge time saver there to go and get that done and get that stood up. So. Once you have your domain picked out, you figure out how you're going to handle your communications um, or how you're going to get your site and the domain control or domain name tied to it, you got to figure out where you're going to host it. If you use Cloud Raccoon, uh, you're sort of going to be tied to hosting it in AWS if that's where you got the IP or Azure or GCP. Uh, you can use DigitalOcean as well to go and host that site. Now, depending on the rules that you had put in place by your organization and the uh, rules of engagement, you might have to have your own internal server set up for that, uh, which you can go and then either put something public facing uh, in your DMZ or internet facing that's allowed to connect back from the cloud and use a redirector to connect back into that um, if you need to. And that's the self-hosted route where you go and you just stand up your own server and have it hosted that way. Um, there's been times I have a number of static IPs on my home uh, connection and times I'll go and stand up a virtual machine and have it sitting right there on the external when data needs to be housed locally. Uh, there's a number of different ways that you can do this and it's really just going to come down to a decision within your organization of how they want you to handle that. Um, so, and rules always fall, read the terms of service, make sure you're not abusing any of those services and you won't have your account shut down. Uh, it's not something I have run into yet having any of my accounts shut down for doing C2 for testing that I'm doing, uh, but I have heard of it happening. 
So moving along, next step of planning is how are you gonna do your communication between the implant that you'll eventually generate to run on the internal systems and command and control server that you, you're standing up? Uh, it depends on the adversary that you wanna to emulate too and what you wanna emulate within the environment. So do you need HTTP callback? Do you need to have HTTPS callbacks? Do you need to have DNS callbacks? Uh, do you need to use a different type of communication internally? Do you need SMB between hosts internally? Uh, you can also do TCP connections as well internally, depending on the C2 framework that you're going to be using. Uh, some other things to take into account uh, as you're building this out and planning things, for domain, or once you have your domain, you'll need to get a certificate if you're going with HTTPS. Are you gonna buy a certificate from a commercial enterprise CA out there? Are you going to use Let's Encrypt to go and get a certificate? Are you going to use a self-signed certificate? Uh, and it's all going to depend again against the adversary that you're emulating for this specific engagement. Uh, self-signed certificate has the highest chance of getting flagged. Um, Let's Encrypt has become very popular for using across a whole number of services now where you can go and just get free certificates for your site. Uh, works well as well for command and control, go and get that certificate and it looks legitimate. You have the nice lock there and it's from a valid CA that systems out there trust. Uh, most expensive route is going the commercial CA, which you can still get those certificates relatively cheap. I see them sub $10 now uh, for going and purchasing one of those. Some of the other decisions you need to make are, you're gonna have this implant called directly back to your command and control server. Um, very common to see that. Are you gonna use domain fronting? Uh, some of the adversaries out there have started doing that depending on which APT you're picking. And you might need to use domain fronting services to get that stood up. Uh, there's still a few out there that allow it uh, that you're able to do domain fronting through. Um, so take a look at it. You can also use that traffic redirector if you need to keep your C2 system hosted internally or on known hardware that you control, but you wanna go through one of the cloud systems out there to do that. So you need to take a look what best suits what adversary you're trying to go and emulate in this specific instance. Some other things you need to think about as well for your payloads, how are you going to get that payload into the organization? Uh, you, you already have your list of users that you're gonna fish. Um, are you gonna attach it to the email that you're sending it to them? That might get caught by the systems that you have, you might not. And you can use this as well to test what you're able to go and get into your organization. Uh, placing a link in your email versus attaching the payload. Um, in that case, you need to have a separate server or another service to host that payload when you send the link in to see if the users are able to click on it, download it, and exploit it or run on their systems. And sometimes companies might have a service exposed that allows for remote code execution and you're able to just use that. Um, take a look at what's available on your organization through Shodan. Um, do scans of your external if that's in scope for your engagement. See what's there and take a look at it. This is really a holistic view of your organization uh, from an adversary's perspective of how they might make their way in. Um, and they're always going to take the route of least resistance. Um, when you're actually crafting your payload that you're gonna send in, are you gonna create a VBA macro and put it in a document or an Excel document and send that in through email? You can do that as a LinkedIn email. You can use an HTA, um, try and get an executable in or PowerShell scripts. Uh, I've used Go as well to create executables, They're rather large, but they work. And there's endless choices that you can use here to go and create and craft those payloads and to find something that may work, um, that copies the adversary that you're interested in for this specific organization and what works for you for this engagement. This might be your first one internally just to get the, the ball rolling for that future. Um, so now you have your payload, you put your plan together, you're gonna need to go and go spear phishing. Uh, you're not gonna just fish everyone across the organization or a couple thousand users. You can be selective, maybe going rounds of phishing. Um, you already have your list of users that you had generated of email addresses. So I've done every single option on this list here. Um, I have run a mail server. It is not fun. I don't recommend it. Maybe you should all try it once. Uh, it's definitely, Challenging to get it up and running. I recommend getting one up and running, leave it running for at least 30 days uh, if you're gonna use it to do phishing so that it can just get uh, known out there, scanned. Okay, this mail server is tied to this domain. It's at least 30 days old. It doesn't seem malicious uh, so that you're able to send email inbound to your organization. Um, you can use G Suite from Google to go and spin these up. 
um, you can get accounts set up, Office 365, you can get free trials for 30 days or so uh, to go and spin up a, a company account with your own custom domain. Um, you can use Namecheap as well. They offer some free email services for various uh, periods of time, I think either two weeks or one month. Uh, they've been changing that up. And you can use all those uh, to do that. And take a look at that as well. There might be a difference if you're using Office 365 for your organization's email and it comes from G Suite, it might be handled differently than it coming from Office 365. So those are different things to take a look at. Look at what the attacker is doing that you're emulating. Um, but you also have to work with what you have available internally when you're doing things on a budget. So now you have all of your infrastructure set up. Uh, what are you going to do? You send the, fema the phishing emails to a couple of the users that are in scope, and hopefully you watch the shells come in. Uh, they execute the payload that you sent in, and you now have access to the internal network. Uh, make sure that you keep all of your logs on your C2. Um, once the engagement's over, copy those down internally if you're using a cloud VPS. Uh, those are what will document everything that you did during the course of the engagement. Uh, make sure you keep them on until the report's finished in a good period of time there afterwards so you have them available to go and reference anything that was done. Uh, if you're making any changes to any systems, um, dropping files on systems, anything you might be doing, any of the actions on objective that you're taking through the course of the engagement, you need to document. And that's just for deconfliction purposes afterwards. Um, even if you are the incident responder who's running this engagement internally just to do it for the first time, document it. You're not gonna remember everything that you did. And later on, you'll be trying to figure out, okay, did, what was this me? Was What was this as you're going through the log? So I really recommend documenting every single lateral movement that's made any change you made, where you drop files, on what systems, and clean up everything that you can beforehand. Um, every time you move laterally to a system, you'll need to do that as well. Any files you may have downloaded and just document. I was able to go and pull this file from this share um, and document that as well. This is, you're demonstrating value to the organization saying we need to go this route, do more testing this way. And the only way you're gonna do that is by showing what was possible during the engagement that you were running. So once you have all of that, you'll need to create your report. Uh, you really wanna put an attack narrative in there. So just a story of how we got in, what users were fished, which users clicked on it, what users did you gain access to? And then for each of the issues that you identify, you're also gonna to wanna to put in steps on how they can be remediated. Now that some of them might take a year, two years, part of a larger project to get the issues fixed throughout the organization, but it's steps in the right direction. Um, a lot of times you may identify some large issues that you never thought were an issue inside of your organization doing this. And typically on your first engagements is when those will be identified. Uh, and you will wanna be able to account for that on the back end. And then once you have your first engagement done, you have your report done, written up, you've turned it in, you've briefed those that you need to brief on the report and walked them through it, start planning for the following year, start working to get it in your budget. So for the total cost of setting up an entire domain, uh, domains vary in price anywhere from $8 up to around $20 or so for the majority of domains out there. I went with an average of about $15. So say you will with command and control domain that costs about 15, email domain that's about 15. Um, I calculated in here using GCP for hosting the VPS. Um, if you're using self-hosted email, you'll have to add in a second VPS as well for that. Uh, G Suite's rather cheap, $6 a month. Uh, Office 365, you get a month for free and you get reputational uh, value right away out of that. And if you get a Komodo SSL certificate, just under $8. So the total cost for doing the entire engagement with this is $68.15. Being able to do that much work for your organization and bring that much value, you didn't have a budget for this at the beginning of this and something you added in as one of your projects throughout the year I think most organizations can probably come up with just under $70 to go and do something that would bring so much value to the organization. Um, I've done it. I've done some slightly larger engagements under this uh, same sort of setup that I think we didn't spend more as a team, more than $500 for a multi-month engagement. Um, now that's not including the cost of having the employee do the work, but it, it still brought a lot of value. Um, spent a lot of time doing OSINT, 
and finding the users that I needed to specifically target, uh, we were able to go and fish those users and we had access directly to users uh, that were the the end goal and gain access to that data that they had access to as part of the engagement. Um, really, the more time you take in the planning side of this, you will benefit from on the engagement side, um, on the actual app action on objective and actually gaining access into your own organization and then moving around laterally if you need to do so. Um, if you spend enough time up front doing the planning, it will take you shorter to actually run the engagement itself. Um, ended up speeding up a little bit right there, but I do just want to go and anyone, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them and I will be here hanging around for a little bit. Sweet, I've been waiting so long for this talk. Um, uh, I guess you can't really say where you've done these, right? Um, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, definitely I can attest personally that I saw the under $500 one uh, being done and shout out to the other folks that they know who they are. They're watching this. Um, great, great, great job. Um, so if you have questions, I see uh, applauses and whatnot here. Um, if you have questions, please go ahead and uh, post them while um, while we wait. Um, for the one that you used, did you mention what uh, C2 uh, you used? I don't think I actually did. Uh, in this case, I had used Empire. Nice. The original yeah. Empire. The original, yeah. I, I, I posted that. I know you've been wanting to do this talk about two years ago, so Empire sounds about right. Um, some a question that I got um, that you didn't mention, but um, what's your experience with things like uh, Evil Engine X um, and GoFish and, and those types of tools? Uh, Evil Engine X, I love it. It's great for getting around two-factor, um, being able to go grab the sessions, grab the user session. Many times they don't even have any idea. Like if you go and buy a domain close enough to the organization's name, the end users will have no idea. Um, some caveats to throw in there. Some things I've seen with like Okta is the Okta plugins within the browser will not work properly if you're fishing for Okta two-factor. Um, so some things may be a little bit strange to the user, but you still have that active session by the time that they actually discover that they might not be on the real site. So just to walk uh, anyone through if they don't know, right? So you are pretty much fishing for someone's username, their password, and their one-time token. Uh, or multi-factor? So with Okta or with Evil Engine X, what you're actually fishing for there, you'll capture their username and password, um, but you, typically you'll be using it to get around two-factor authentication. So you won't actually get access to say Duo. If it's a Duo push to their phone, you won't be able to get access to their phone to approve the push, uh, but they'll approve their own push because they're logging in themselves from Duo. And then you'll actually have the session cookie itself to go and access the service. So you'll then just drop that into Firefox with a cookie editor and you have access into the user session at that point and all their cloud resources that they might have or even Citrix directly to the internal network. Nice, yeah. So uh, with Citrix or any of those remote tools nowadays, right, you, you'd you be able to, uh, to piggyback on that and then just execute code, right? Like initial access, you don't have to exploit anything. You just log in with the credentials and then execute uh, your payload yourself <laughs> without having to fish. That's that's awesome. Um, we have a question here about um, what wrote mis misdirection tools. I'm guessing it's redirection tools, redirectors, relays. So um, how do you keep or what tools do you use for redirectors and relays so that when it comes in, you know where it's coming from. If it's coming from your target environment, you send it to the right place. If it's coming from the wrong target environment, you send it somewhere else. What what tools do you, do you like for that? So I'll typically use Apache with mod rewrite on there. Um, and I'll start writing custom rules within mod rewrite to identify the exact URLs that I would expect to be coming from the implant that's running. So you can usually customize the user agent string if you want to change that slightly. Uh, you'll have the URL that it's going to, and you can even, if you do enough OSINT or it's a large enough organization, you will know what IP addresses they're coming from as well. So you can start combining all of those together on the redirectors to figure out exactly what you want to allow through the redirector or just reject and I don't know what you're talking about, 404. Awesome. 
I think someone had a question about the C, uh, C2 matrix is the C2matrix.com. Um, it, it does have a q and A. I I just answering that question live since it just came in uh, from Mr. Bart or Mr. B. I guess I shouldn't drop your real name if you don't want to show it. Um, any other questions that we have here? We, we got a few more minutes um, before our next speaker, although I see Adam's here um, as well. And um, yeah, any questions you have, Dave is on Discord as well. So he'll be um, answering questions there. And I'm really glad you did this talk, uh, Dave. It's, it's been been too long since uh since that particular engagement where where you where you did this on the budget now for anyone that's new right obviously you're not putting into context or into you're not calculating right your actual time right obviously you have over five years experience uh running operating and and leading a red team but someone's new they're get just getting started right where can they go to kind of you know, play with some of these free tools. I know you mentioned some of it. What would you recommend they start with? Maybe some CTF, although CTFs aren't very red teamy, or just setting up your own lab. Uh, what, what, what would you say as someone that's new and wants to wants to eventually do this? Uh, best way to start is start with your own lab at home. Get, get a Linux system up and running that you'll use as your C2 server, and then have your Windows system to be the victim if you're going for Windows environment, uh, maybe build out a small domain if you have enough resources or just domain controller and one regular system. And you can start using that. Uh, I'll typically build a lab environment of the client or the target environment that I'm going after, depending on what I'm doing, so that I have a lab environment to test things before they're actually executed in production as well. Uh, so I'll never stop using labs, but that's one way to start. And then you start with a local lab, then you move to a VPS server to make sure you have your setup correctly and start progressing down that road. Awesome. Um, I just had another question. Oh, yes. Um, so this question came up uh, on Twitter a couple days ago and figured I might as well ask you since we're here. Um, this was obviously something you did a couple of years ago. Nowadays, we see a lot of organizations moving from their standard antivirus to EDR solutions. As a consultant or, you know, kind of on the budget, how can you kind of build an environment with that EDR? Is it as simple, right? Because for antivirus, we have like virus total or things like that, where you can just get the trial of the AV. But how does it work for EDRs? Can anyone just go and get a trial of an EDR or is it harder? And do you have any um, ideas on, on how I, I can do it, right? Imagine I want to play with uh, Sentinel or with uh, Defender ATB or something like that. How would I go about that? So it, for some of them, it's possible to get into your lab environment. You might be able to find some vendors out there that do reselling of managed EDR. Uh, typically that's targeted a lot of the SMBs out there. So companies that are like, up to 200 machines or so they're able to go and buy because typically the license is at minimum a thousand machines um, but those still are hard to find so a lot of them it's wait till you're doing a pen test into an environment like that or if you have enough money to drop for a lab signing up for a full license to be able to get that going running in a lab um, that's definitely one of the challenges i even have is getting all the various edrs antiviruses into a lab because of the minimum licensing requirements that they have. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dave, for your time. Thank you for, for uh, finally doing this talk. I, I love the Grim logo here on the top right associated with your name now. Congrats again with your new role. I uh, look forward to working with you and welcome to the, the Grim family. Thank you. And I will be on the uh, Red Team Happy Hour later on. Awesome, sweet. All right, well, we're glad that uh, in true Florida weather, uh, we had this crazy thunderstorm during the talk, and now that thunderstorm is gone and the sun is out. Um, very typical here, but obviously it happened right during uh, the talk. <laughs> Thankfully, we did not lose uh, any uh, the, the power or anything like that. 